Dobrý večer. Good evening. Vítám vás. I would like to welcome you as the dean of the social studies faculty at the Masaryk University at this meeting part of the European dialogues. You may wonder or perhaps even smile at uh, l when you looked at the core organizers that the Brno version of the dialogues of Václav Havel named Truth in Politics and the Politics in Truth is organized by the Faculty of Social Studies. The very faculty, the students of which uh, deconstruct those eternal truths, that's the faculty where the students are frequently educated in the uh, fact that it's not impar important what the things are in fact, but as they are interpreted. So why do, are we helping to create environment for dialogues where we want to think about the position of truth in politics and about a certain ontologic dimension of the truth? The reason is that we realize that the, consciously or subconsciously, we desire for a fixed point in the world of the flowing time, in the world based on unstable sand or quicksand, that we desire for at least small certainty in this flow of uncertainty, that even the largest skeptic that always quotes the, the, the famous Socrates, uh, I know that I don't know anything, it's not that the fixed and true point wouldn't exist, but he hasn't find it, found it yet. I don't want to guess what both main speakers are going to talk about. And I know that I'm already sinning by uh, uh, the same sin as frequently organizers of conferences, sin that uh, they present their own contribution that no one expects. I will keep quiet in a moment, yet I want to share one particular point. This event, including the topic, was started being organized in January, several weeks before another historic uh, outflow of the Russian barbar barbari barbarian or barbarism. I had doubts about the relevance of this topic. I didn't share it with anybody. I wondered how many current pilots we have who ask, what is truth? Finally, I settled with the Abrahamian answer. Perhaps at least 10 like that will be found. And looking into the whole, I didn't have to argue or beg the Lord as much as the Abraham had to concerning Sodoma and Gomorrah. So even for the 10 people, it's worthwhile to, to do it. And there are more than 10 people. At the end of February changed everything, and suddenly we realized that the research of fake news, uh, fake information is not only a hobby for a few politologists and media scientists who haven't found any more attractive topics, but it's the an area that decides about our current and future freedom, or lack of it. Newly, and some people again realized not, that not everything can be freely deconstructed, that good is not evil and evil is not good. The truth is not lie and lie is not truth. So I want to thank both main appreciated guests uh, uh, traveling from Baltimore, Lechowice, or Prague, even though they could spend their time in a more pleasant way. But they both know that there are certain things or challenges that we should go for because they are correct. So I want to thank the library of uh, Václav Havel and Michal Žantovsky <coughs> for the first great opportunity to cooperate. And I hope that this is not the last chance. So I wish that to all of us, that together with this pilot like asking what is the truth, we achieve this, uh, the state that the desire for truth is one of the constants that when we ask about the truth, we ask about a man so that we can say, in all humbleness. May we realize that the truthful words are the substance of truthful people. Thank you again and welcome again. 
and I was supposed to pass the mic to another uh, person who, for the opening speech, but we can't do that because Mr. Jantowski is here, but I'm supposed to pass the word to a pre-recorded video opening speech of the Minister for European Affairs, Mikuláš Beck. So I'm going to do it in this digital way. But, but I'm looking forward to how he's going to co-open this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, let me greet you, at least in this way, as I cannot be with you personally today. The personality, and most of all, the legacy of Václav Havel, bear a personal meaning for me and my close collaborators. That is why we have chosen Europe as a task, as the motto for the Czech presidency of the Council of the EU. This idea is symbolic not only for our presidency, but also for this event which builds on the, the ideas and legacy of our first post-89 president. We still need to learn to think like Europeans and be proud to be part of this community. Indeed, the events of recent weeks and months are proof of this. I am pleased that we will now have the opportunity to chair the Council of the EU and be seen in a different light. We are already proving to our partners in the EU that we can be solidary and can spontaneously help when it's needed and without asking what we will get for it. So let me wish this great project success successful future and even more participants who will spread the ideas of Václav Havel and the European values further. Goodbye. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all who have come here instead of to the lake. Thank you for coming here and meeting with us and for sharing something about the truth of politics and the politics of the truth. I want to welcome all of you, not only here in this room, but also many others who will be watching our debate online um, via the um, Václav Havel Library website if you'd like to see yourselves I once again. I to English uh, because uh, of uh, our distinguished speaker and uh, because uh, uh, these dialogues will be uh, broadcast on the Havel channel uh, simultaneously in Czech and uh, in English. And when I thought about uh, my introductory remarks, there's uh, one scene that has been with me since the beginning of this week, and that was the incredible scene of Vladimir Putin speaking in the Red Square uh, on the occasion of the anniversary of the end of the Second World War. And uh, there was... Uh, one book that uh, his speech kept uh, make me think about, and uh, that was uh, George Orwell's 1984. Uh, in uh, Orwell's book, uh, he left us with uh, uh, a very bleak and dark picture of uh, uh, a dystopian future uh, in which uh, the truth is uh, lie, the peace is war, uh, and the uh, shortages uh, are 
welfare, uh, and so on. And Putin basically said very much the same thing. He said that the uh, Ukrainian uh, defenders, uh, many of them uh, descendants of uh, uh, the victims of Holodomor and of Holocaust, are the Nazis. Uh, he said that uh, uh, the uh, aggression, the Russian aggression against Ukraine is the defense of uh, 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 Russia. And he said that uh, uh, the soldiers who have uh, committed barbaric acts against the Ukrainian uh, civilians and uh, people of Ukraine are the uh, liberators. Uh, and while the performance of the Russian army against uh, Ukraine may have been quite unimpressive so far, the weaponization of linguistic and semantic relativity by Russia, as evidenced in the words of Vladimir Putin, but also of uh, Sergei Lavrov and others, has exceeded everything that they, in famous predecessors from Benito Mussolini through Joseph Goebbels to Joseph Stalin, have been able to accomplish. In watching the revolting assault against true several hundred kilometers to our east, we should, however, not be content with our role as spectators, and even less so given to feelings of moral superiority and complacency. In a myriad of less conspicuous ways, truth is under attack everywhere. And politics is one of the main culprits. The manipulation of language in the euphemisms, the spins and distortions of reality is an everyday occurrence in politics, serving to obscure, if not the whole truth, then at least its hard edges. Political expressions such as collateral damage, quantitative easing, or asset optimization are designed to desensitize the audiences to violence against innocent civilians, the habit of governments to print money that our children will have to pay back, or to the dangers of money laundering. As an intrinsic part of the political process, many of these distortions are not dangerous in and of themselves, but can lead to further distortions of reality and eventually to a break with reality and attempts to replace it by alternative realities. So this is the issue at the core of the ninth edition of the Václav Havel European Dialogues, conducted in the Czech Republic and other European cities since 2014, and based on the premise that Europe cannot be a comfortable home for all its citizens without a common space for discourse, dialogue, and diversity. For the first time this year, the dialogues are taking place not only in Prague, but also in Pilsen and Brno. We are grateful to all our partners and sponsors who have helped us to make this expanded series of dialogues possible. First of all, the Vice President of the European Commission, Viera Jourova, the Czech Minister of European Affairs, Mikuláš Beck. Thank you, Mr. Minister and the Czech Minister of Culture, Martin Baxa, under whose collective auspices these dialogues are taking place. The representation of the European Commission in the Czech Republic, who have been our partners for many years now. The Faculty of Social Sciences at Charles University in Prague. The Faculty of Education of the Best Bohemian University in Pilsen. And the Faculty of Social Studies of the Masaryk University in Brno. Thank you, Dean Balik. In the 
following debate, we will hear from two eminent thinkers and writers who are more than qualified to pronounce on the issues that I have only touched upon here. Uh, they are in no particular order. Uh, Peter Pomerantsev, a writer, a journalist, a filmmaker, uh, one of the most uh, interesting uh, minds in uh, the West, I dare to say, uh, today. And interestingly enough, also someone who was born in Kiev and, uh, uh, and moved to England and to Germany and uh, most recently to the United States and uh, have intrigued uh, his audiences and listeners uh, everywhere, in particular with uh, two spectacular books, uh, uh, the book uh, about disinformation in Russia, where nothing is true and everything is possible, and uh, his second book, This is Not Propaganda. And our second speaker will be Marek Otto Vacha, a, 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 what do they call that in English? A, a man of the cloth. A man of the cloth, a clergyman, uh, a, a Catholic priest, but uh, also a, a naturalist, uh, a professor of uh, medical ethics, uh, a adventurer, a scout, a traveler, an evolutionary biologist. Should I continue, Marek? No. Uh, so you can see that we are in for a very interesting time. And I will now ask uh, Petra Mlenková, a politologist at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University here, who will serve as our moderator to invite our two guests on the podium and start the proceedings. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome again to today's debate, Truth of Politics and the Politics of Truth. And the debate will be organized in Czech, as agreed with the organizers. And interpreting is provided for Mr. Pomerancev. And if you want to ask any questions, and I will appreciate them, and I hope we will hear many questions because there's a rare opportunity. So obviously you can ask your questions in Czech or in English, whatever you prefer. Everything will be interpreted to the other language. So not to hold more of your time, let's use the time efficiently. Let me start by asking Peter, currently we live in a world in which uh, important role is played by uncontrolled social networks or social media and uh, cyberspace. We live in the world where everybody can say whatever they want to, anybody can have their own truth, uh, facts are banned and the truth of those who 
present so-called alternative facts, they, they become very much stronger, and those that spread lies just laugh, and they admit that we know that we lie, but you can't do anything about that. So that's my first question. Isn't this a lost battle before it even started uh, to fight for truth in, wor in the world like this? Uh, that's a very hard question to answer confidently. Um, I'm going to speak very slowly, yeah, because I hear no, I see nobody's using translation. It's okay, I'll speak slowly. If I'm speaking too fast, tell me. Um, so, um, it, it's it's a hard question to uh, to answer confidently because we can't look into the future, but maybe we can look into the past because this has happened before. And very often, when a new information technology appears, it creates this sort of disruption. So when the printing press first appears, um, there's a proliferation of conspiracy theories. The old, you know, if in Europe, before the arrival of the printing press, all the truth was contained in the church and in the Catholic Church in particular, you know, the arrival of the printing press helps lead to a, a fracturing um, into many churches. You know, we have the wars of religion breaking out. Um, we should remember that a lot of the first you know, things that were being printed were conspiracy theories, you know, uh, calls to um, attack people, um, hates what we would call hate speech now, incitement to violence. Um, stigmatization of women as witches, you know, this was not pretty. Um, and then when radio appears, the first people who really take advantage of it are, are the Nazis and, and the Soviets. And it takes a while for the forces of democracy or, or some sort of ethics to respond, but they usually do in the end. You know, the printing press, in the end, catalyzes the, the, you know, the Renaissance and, and ultimately the Enlightenment. The radio um, is then used in, you know, in a very creative way by the BBC, by Roosevelt in America. So it just takes a little bit of time. You know, it just takes a little bit of time because first what is unleashed is energy, maybe some hope, but also a lot of chaos and a lot of evil. Um, so, so I think we're gonna see the same thing with the internet. There was a moment of hope at the start, a lot of optimism, like with radio. When radio first appears, people dream that will end wars because people will to hear each other in different countries and communicate with each other and there will be no more wars. People wrote about this. And then very quickly Hitler takes advantage of it and Stalin takes advantage of it and there's a lot more wars where radio is instrumentalized. So I think we're seeing the same thing with the internet as we saw with radio. So first this optimism, then this kind of sense that the bad guys are taking advantage of it. And it's taking a little bit of time for, for the forces that want to see a kind of a democratic public sphere where we can talk to each other as equals um, to really get on top of things. But we have to understand the hugeness of the challenge. You know, the response in the crisis of radio was new regulation, the creation of institutions as huge as the BBC. I mean, these are massive interventions. And, and really, the, the, you know, a new education system to go with it. So I think the same thing is going to be necessary here. Huge new regulation, which is starting to happen at the EU level. Um, the creation of completely new institutions that create content and design on the internet and um, a whole new generation that, that is educated in a way that, that sort of fits these challenges. So historically, historically we do get to a good point. However, the question is, are we gonna have something like the 30 years war or the second world war first before we get there? So it's just how bad will the turbulence be? I don't know. Thank uh, you. Mark, the same question to you. Does it make sense to fight for truth 
or to endeavor towards truth. I prepared a little bit. If the question concerns the truth, the first thing that comes to mind is you, you remember the Czech radio in which Veronika Sedláčková invited two people, Vladimir Bacha and Jiří Grigar, and the discussion was the following. Bacha uh, claimed that the earth was flat and Grigar claimed that it wasn't flat. And the only thing that was missing was that the uh, listeners should vote based by their text messages uh, to uh, to say who's got better arguments or who's more uh, able to ridicule the uh, opponent. And we, because uh, my first discipline is uh, nuclear biology, we have this wall of facts and the nature always uh, persuades us what's truth and what's not. As uh, Mr. Balik said, or Professor Balik said, he said it ex exactly, that it belongs more into the f uh, soft sciences like the uh, so, uh, social sciences. And we don't have it because we have to go for facts. So one would say that we've got this wall of natural sciences that will stop us. It, it does it sometimes, but as you now you can see that the, there is the highest number of people in the history who believe that the earth is flat in the Czech Republic. And that's, the, that's a fact. And to make it even more complicated, and I don't want to make it a lecture, we might say that at least in the natural sciences, we know what's true. We follow the facts and they lead, wherever they lead us. The dictator in the science is an experiment. So we are getting to know the world. And sometimes we believe that the truth is, even though no teacher will say this, so we look at the world through glasses that were prepared by our teachers at the elementary school, secondary school or university. And we believe that the world behind the window is the truth that is waiting to be discovered. And the whole science is just this. Uh, activity and we can think of the moment where the last Nobel Prize will be awarded for the last discovery, the last time the celebrities will meet in Stockholm, last uh, speeches will be and then nature and science and it will continue in white pages and we will close the book uh, titled Nature because we've solved everything. So that's how many people view it. Uh, Thomas Kuhn came and he built the structure of scientific revolutions and suddenly we realized that everything is different. It's not that we would be climbing up the floors on the pyramid of knowledge as we believe. Thomas Kuhn basically said, to summarize it, he proved in a nice way that Einstein phys didn't build an extra floor to the pyramid. He ex blew up everything that came in in 67 when Principia was written, that mass meant something different for Einstein than for Newton. So after Kuhn, we started asking, so is the world behind the windows? What is it actually? Does, is there an objective truth about this world? In natural sciences, we still believe that there is, but we have to admit that as much as we ridiculed the uh, pre Maya system and sometimes we ridicule the idea of the world of three dimensions like an aquarium because we, we have Einstein, it may be that in 200 years other people will laugh at our today's physics. So that's the natural science. And then the truth which is softer, like the truth of the war in the Ukraine. Again, as a natural scientist, I can say that we can have a right to have our own opinions, but we should have the right to, to facts, because the facts are measurable, recordable, so it's not our facts. Uh, the topic of today's debate, apart the truth, uh, it focuses on politics as well. 
So again, both of you, could you tell me how do you view the role of politicians who uh, are visible uh, on, our, on the political scene, who are called populists in the recent years, like Donald Trump, Nigel Farage, or in the Czech Republic, Andrei Babish, Tomio Okamura, and others? The list would be rather long. So what I want to ask you is, you both are experienced uh, in a different country, I've gathered your experience in a different country. How these, this type of politicians change the perception of the truth in the society? How the society perceives the truth under the influence of those people? Have they caused any devolution of the term truth? So Peter, could you start? You've got experience from the United States and from the Great Britain or UK. Yeah, I mean, I do. Um, I think both in terms of Donald Trump and to a lesser extent Boris Johnson, um, I think we underestimate the sort of pleasure in rejecting facts. Facts are very often unpleasant. They tell you that, I don't know, they tell you that you're overweight, you know, that your life hasn't gone as well as you wanted, that you're gonna die. And so there's this kind of pleasure in throwing off the facts and sticking a middle finger up to the facts. And I think we underestimate how much pleasure it gives. It's a very anarchic pleasure and it's very much associated in its anarchy to also revolutionizing moral laws and sometimes just laws. <laughs> you know, you create this sort of wasteland around you. Now that's a lot of fun on a carnival once a year or on Friday night. It's probably quite healthy to do that, both as a person, as a society, but it's not a way towards any kind of society where justice or an idea of the future can, can articulate themselves. And I think, you know, the most intense place I've seen that in, in my experiences is, is Russia, where I lived for nine years, between 2001 to 2010, and which I described in my first book, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible, which would try to capture this, the essence of this. And it was very interesting living there in that time because it was a society that had decided that there was no future, that nothing, there was nothing really to plan for, that, you know, all the big ideas of the Enlightenment were dead. Communism, they never really believed in the last 20 years, but then democratic capitalism, they thought was a lie as well, completely cynical about all models of the future. So instead, you had this sort of nostalgia that compensates it for the lack of a future. And Ambassador Zantovsky noted Putin's speech, and Putin never talks about the future. It doesn't exist in Russian discourse. It's only ever about fantasies of the past. And at the same time, denying the reality of the past. You know, I suppose the reason that um, they can't start going into detail about the past is they haven't even tried to face up to it. Um, and with that, this kind of rebellion against the facts. And I think it makes us think, why do we need facts in political speech? And usually facts in political speech have got to do with an idea of the future. Um, you know, you're planning something and you have to show that you're gonna get there. Um, both democratic capitalism and communism pretended to respect facts. They lied all the time, especially communism, but you know, it was meant to be scientific. It was meant to be a scientific version of history. You were meant to prove that you were reaching utopia. In this kind of state where there is no idea of the future, then, um, then facts are just unnecessary. And it's, I just came back from Ukraine, and you go to these places that have just been liberated from the Russians. So I was in Chernigiv and Bucha, all around the sort of north of Kiev. And, and it's a catalog of atrocities, murders, rapes, um, destroyed buildings, 
but for no reason. You know, when I talked to the people who'd been held by the Russians, a lot of them would ask the Russians, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? And the Russians would just come up with some nonsense. You know, there are Nazis here. I think there's no Nazis. You know, we're doing this because we want you to be with us, but we don't want to be with you. And very quickly, the Russian soldiers would run out of words. And there was just this sense of complete senselessness to all of it. Even as an imperial war, it doesn't really work. If Kremlin had a genuine ambitions for an imperial war in Ukraine, this is not how you do it. And it's almost as if the senselessness is the point. You know, it's this act of complete and utter pointlessness. And almost that's the point. We're going to come here with no particular reason. We're going to kill for no particular reason. We're going to murder for no particular reason. It isn't even that strategic. It isn't even thought through in the way the Nazis had this horrific plan. It's just we're going to impose the pointlessness and the senselessness that we feel onto you so you can live in the same world where there's no truth, no facts, no future, so that you feel what we feel. So sort of the senselessness is the point. And, and you know, I suppose you know, Russia is a very extreme version, but this is what I, I often feel is very dangerous about these, what well, you call them populists, I don't like this term. But sort of the Dutertes of this world, the Bolsonaros, it's almost as if the gesture itself becomes the point, which is something that students of fascism talk about a lot as well, of course. The gesture itself is, is the absolute point, and the gesture just signifies a lack of meaning. And if there's one strategy to what Putin has been doing for decades now in Grozny, in Syria, in Ukraine, it's to wipe out any kind of ideals of humanitarian norms, any ideas of human rights, all the sort of architecture that we built up with the Enlightenment, which is completely to do with an idea that there is a future that we're trying to get to about a better world, just to destroy all of that, just say, no, we live in a wasteland. And the wasteland in my, in his soul is the one we need to live in. So that's the end point. I'm not saying like Babish is going to take you there, don't worry, <laughs> or, or Zeman, or, or any of these other guys. They're kind of little, you know, they're, they're, they're little shadows of this much larger and scarier thing. So, so. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, I'm an old person, and when I was young, we used to read Solzhenitsyn's children. We don't have to agree with all of his opinions, but a long, long time ago, Solzhenitsyn in his book, Cancer, actually describes and sort of um, envisions these departments of people uh, who have cancer and they're in these departments. And, and um, in 1970, when he got his Nobel Prize, his precisely prepared speech titled one word of truth and he puts the stress on truth uh, um, for the truth to remain the truth the Czech Republic and I'm sure you've got your own views of that has a bit of a better position than the current Russia however it seems to me that we've got uh, what philosophers call the hermeneutics of suspicion people like Andrei Babish or Miloš Zeman um, create some sort of mistrust between the citizens and the government but if uh, the country is economically prosperous then the, um, the problem is not so visible and when Corona showed up, um, the problem became much more visible. The politician comes and says that we are ordering people to, for example, wear masks. And hermeneutics means not what, what the politician is saying that, but why is they say why are they saying that? So, oh, he probably has a company producing masks, otherwise they wouldn't say that. Or he's a part of a, of a world, uh, world uh, eradication goal circle or something when they started speaking about uh, a compulsory um, vaccination everyone thought like oh they must have some shares with Pfizer or something and people 
don't ever think that our politicians could actually say something that is actually good. So the current uh, government of our Prime Minister Petra Fiala and even our Ministry of Health has got these extremely important tasks to point out uh, in relation to, for example, the corona crisis and even the war in Ukraine. They have the task, they're standing before the task to come up with some uh, proper solution or tangible solution, but the more important task is to convince uh, the citizens that the government actually strives for the optimum solution, that the, that the um, intention of the government is to help the citizens and to come up with a solution that will be good for this country. Um, only when the government actually proposes a solution, it's not because that they would have some sort of companies backstage or that they would pr probably like to get money from some friendly coal barons or it's not because that they are part of some sort of global plot uh, to fool uh, everyone. Uh, the government has to actually convince the citizens that they want to actually act the best they can. And the Czech political scene is interesting because, well, I'm a Catholic priest, so you're sort of sensitive to some things. And I think, and we say our uh, medical students the same thing, that if a doctor is uh, at work from seven to five, no one has to ask of him, not even the other, um, not even the other, their boss or anyone else in the hospital, to lie in their job. This is a privilege even of every tram driver or even everyone else. If I go to work, I have the right and duty not to lie. So if a politician such as uh, Michal Hasek, who in 2013 in DVTV 11 times lied, quite it's been proven, then it's quite impossible for CSSD to actually uh, ask him to be their election manager because he's very capable. So this is sort of a message to the voters, and it might be minimalistic or maybe even uh, quite bold of me to ask of a politician if he's caught lying not to be not to continue being a politician it's not a maximalist requirement it's a requirement of every tram driver every doctor uh, because if it turned out that a doctor lied to their patient well then their chair would be wobbly in truth and they could be just sacked so why not to ask um, this of all politicians, if it turns out that they lie, they shouldn't be going politicians. Dr. David Rath uh, had an article for Idnes um, titled Big and Small Lies. And he said, yes, I do lie, but in some cases I don't lie, which is nice. But then, yeah, that's how it works, and I lie, and yeah. Well, if our politicians, are, or even if Miller Zeman says that he believes that um, there are probably no Russian soldiers in Donbass because Lavrov told him, well, obviously the politician in a functioning democracy should be disqualified in such a way that he shouldn't be in politics anymore. So the government that is um, there right now has got a very difficult task ahead of them to actually dig out all those grenades that are deep down within the nation, um, to dig them out and, and remedy uh, the situation in order to re-establish some sort of ethos and some sort of atmosphere saying what is um, desirable and what is not, what the civic uh, society will bear and what it won't. So if they want a politician not to lie, it's not some sort of maximalist requirement, but it's absolute minimalism of, of why, what I can ask of a person who has been elected into a post. Can politics be done this way? If I dare say, is it not naive to ask this of politicians to only speak the truth? Well, this meeting is organized by the Library of Václav Havel, or Václav Havel Library, and there is a politician who has actually managed to do that. Well, let's hope our politicians are going to take this to heart. If I'm not mistaken, you are the also the advisor to one of our ministers, so I hope you are pressing on him that way. Is it working?
Pracovní tajemství, rozumím. OK. Um, medical uh, secret? Dobrá. Uh, All right. If we agree that truth is an important value that is worth fighting for and protecting, I'd like to ask Peter, how do you think democracy should defend itself and in what way should it protect its citizens and whether democracy in its fundamental level should actually take any steps? Should it work with its citizens, its society and protect the society from manipulation? Yeah, this is something that I've been forced to, to think about a lot. And to be honest, I've ended up really looking at the question slightly differently. Especially in a democracy, you can't have anyone being the arbiter of truth. And even something science, truth is emergent always. So, so this idea that there'll be sort of a, you know, truth cops running around going, ah, you lied. I mean, that's... That's a different type of Orwellian nightmare. So I don't think it's, and also I don't think it's about that. I think, I think we get confused with the symptom and not the larger cause. And we've all been thinking a lot recently about what makes democracies democracies. We've had this sort of crisis about, so, so what is it? Is it elections? Is that it? Orban has elections. It's not a democracy. Um, is, it, is it just a free market? China and Singapore have free markets. They're not democracies. Is it courts? Without a doubt, you need courts. But again, that's probably not enough. And I think we've slowly realized it's this very poor, it's also, apart from these things, this very poorly described and understood thing called, well, it's usually called a public sphere. I work at somewhere at Johns Hopkins University called the Agora Institute, which is sort of dedicated to this question. The Agora was a place in ancient Athens. It was on the main market square in ancient Athens, and people would come in the evening, and there would be speakers, and it's where they would debate the main questions about what Athens should do as a city-state, and they would vote on it. And everyone, by everyone I mean men, <laughs> Slave-owning men, that was everyone then, was allowed to take part. So it's the place where democracy happens as discourse, as discussion. And we've never really thought very hard about this. We have no real social science of the relationship between information and democracy. We have a lot of cliches in our head. Something in America that people use as the cliche. It's not a cliche, it's a myth of the marketplace of ideas, which is an idea which has never been tested, that in a, you know, democracy is like a marketplace, and if, you know, in, if you say the best ideas and the best, the most accurate things, they will eventually rise to the top through a theory of rational choice. Everything we know from behavioral economics, from cultural anthropology, tells us that rational choice is not, not always what we do. So this idea we will produce good journalism and it will come to the top is, is a myth. It's a mystical idea about how society works. It has nothing to do with reality. We always have assumptions that pluralism is automatically going to lead to better debate and better democracy. And certainly the lack of pluralism is a tragedy and a sign of dictatorship. But in America, we have amazing pluralism, and it's led to crazy polarization, which means society can no longer function as a democracy because people can't talk to each other. So we had all these lazy assumptions about how do you create an information environment that's good for democracy, where truth is a value, where truth is valued. I don't think we have to run around looking for catching people out on lies. That's, that's silly. But it's about having an environment well, for what? So I was talking to my colleague who runs the um, MIT 
Media Lab. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a university in, 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 in Boston. And they were trying to break this down. What is healthy democratic discourse? He called it civic discourse. And he actually broke it down into three things. And I think we've, in my research at Hopkins, we've come to the same conclusion. This is very simplistic, but I think it works. One is people have to be able to see the other person as human. Yeah? And the tragedy in America is that the country has, due to propaganda, has started to see each other in these scary categories, liberal versus conservative. You know? Each one thinks the other will bring the apocalypse. So step number one is not thinking like that, being able to see beyond these paranoid identities, which are often created on purpose, and seeing the other with a bit of empathy. I don't, mind, I don't mean being nice to fascists, by the way. You know, this is an old paradox of democracy. If somebody doesn't believe in democracy, they're excluded from the conversation. But for people who all do believe in democracy, step number one is seeing each other with a minimum of empathy. That's actually the hardest thing. And the way to do that is through culture and art and movies and TV shows. It's got nothing to do with truth. But without that, or religious gatherings, without that, nothing else can happen. Number two is having an idea of what evidence is. We have to be able to agree what is a piece of evidence, or else we have no rules. Now, again, it's actually the act of creating those rules together that matters. And we see that in little things, like you talked about social media. Facebook is terrible because we don't understand the rules of Facebook. Somebody's creating it far away. There are social media platforms where people get together at the start and say, these are the rules here. This is how we measure evidence. And we all agree this is how we measure evidence. So it's not about a piece of truth. It's about being able to do, agree as a group, as a society, what is evidence. And the third one is that this empathy and this common set of rules leads to political and social change. Because what we see a lot is a lot of blah, blah, blah. And there's some dictators now which are very happy with people doing blah, blah, blah. You can talk as much as you want. You can't change anything. So it's empathy, common rules about what evidence is and what truth is, and then actually it doing something. And a lot of frustration which the populists capitalize on is the sense that you can say anything you want in Western democracies, but it doesn't matter. That's all. one of their big arguments, you know, is that you have, your words don't matter, and instead of that, we'll do things for you. So those three things are, are key. And when we think about the information environment of the future, the public sphere of the future, which will be not purely, but very reliant on, on the internet, we have to think how we design an internet and an information environment where all those three things are happening. So that's what we've come to in our, in our thinking. Um, but again, I, I think you know, that's not a very scientific approach. I, I think we do. I think we need a whole new science of information and democracy to try to understand these challenges. Um, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you may know or not to know, I traveled from Prague to Brno. I listened to the news that NIC.cz will release the blockage of those eight disinformation servers. And last week I was at a conference for judges and state prosecutors where the, a proposal was presented that this blockage of those servers wouldn't survive in front of the European court. And there was also an opinion, I just offering that, yes, we can block those servers, but those people who relied on them, they remain. And the only terrorist in the Czech Republic, Mr. Balda, he was inspired by those sources. And it links my mind to the medical ethics we can't live without realizing that each country protects the citizens from themselves. Whether we want or don't want, we always balance between totalitarianism and liberal society. Like 
you cannot buy soft drugs in the Czech Republic. Uh, some people would say, why not? Uh, you can't smoke in a restaurant. So the government believes that they have to protect our health by banning smoking in restaurants. I used the seat belt in my car. Again, it's it's regulation of the government. So that's what I said to our uh, students. You all know those uh, salespeople who cheat uh, pensioners, they are typically young guys, and uh, they sell overpriced uh, cutlery and kitchen utensils to uninformed pensioners. And we want to pr protect the weaker group from the aggressive group because we believe that this is not fair. But by protecting our pensioners or elderly citizens, and we believe we do a correct thing, someone might say, but that's a paternalist uh, state that needs to guide their citizens by hand. So I said to my students that it might be better for me and increase my freedom if I could uh, drop a few coins to gambling machines at the faculty. And I don't have this freedom because the government pushed all the gambling machines out of uh, central centers of cities and that reduces my freedom also for the fact that the uh, the criminal activity of gamblers are more expenses, expensive than uh, proceeds from the gambling machines. So uh, when I was in the United States, in Florida, nobody would sell us alcohol after midnight because at night, well, I'm in a democratic country which restricts uh, its freedoms and making sure that their citizens are protected from themselves. So each country tries to protect their citizens. And it's a very interesting thing for the medical ethics. If you have a Je Jehovah Witness, uh, uh, he can pay for driving without seat belts, and then the, the same Jehovah Witness can decide that they don't want a transfusion or something that decides about their life or death. So think about this. There is not a one-fits-all solution how it should be. But let's agree that this exists, and it's a very sensitive issue for all politicians uh, to pass certain particular laws to give as much freedom as possible to the citizens. And on the other hand, each country also uh, make, makes sure that they protect uh, uh, their citizens from their own uh, unhealthy activities. There are other examples. Uh, the possibility of personal bankruptcy. And uh, I might name many others. Oh, thank you very much for your note, because this is linked to the limit of how long we are within the democratic principles and when are we crossing them are going for censorship. And it's a very sensitive issue. And in this context, another question comes to mind, ethical question. Would you have an answer or at least an idea? Artificial intelligence. Currently, and it's been accelerated by this war that uh, Russia wages in the Ukraine. There are various IT companies or even individuals or group of IT experts try to uh, develop algorithms or to use artificial intelligence for detection of truth or verification of truth in the cyberspace. And the artificial intelligence obviously is a great ethical question mark. So how do you see that in connection with information and the usage of uh, AI? I, ha I have a joke that <laughs> no, no student will ever ask me because they know that they would lose another 90 minutes with me asking this question. So we have to think in a new way, think about things that we are confronted with. And it all started a long time uh, when, when drones were introduced to the war in Iraq or Afghanistan, 
they could recognize faces and they were supposed to shoot without a person would somehow influence them. So that was the first wave of this of these debates, how to introduce the ethics into artificial intelligence. And what we can firmly say that there are always people behind those those programmers of these things, designers of those inventions. And there's also an intelligence that is self-learning. So the only safe thing we can say is that there are people behind each technical device that develop the AI in so well so that uh, to make sure that the AI still serves the mankind. Well, this, this wasn't 90 minutes, so you were great. A question for Peter. I asked you before whether democracy has a chance to influence or rather protect its citizens from manipulation and lie. Um, now, I would like to know, and again, in the background of the current war, whether democracy has the right to influence the society of a different country in the same way. For example, at this moment, Russian society. So, for example, Czech um, intelligence services start carrying out some psychological operations in Russia, trying to influence Russian population in an effort to actually turn over or, or stop the conflict. Do you think democracy has the right to do that or attempt that? So, so there's all sorts of different types of communication that you can and should, I think, um, uh, engage with, with another country. I mean, firstly, we all want to live in a world of open information, so it's completely, you know, that's completely in keeping with democratic values that, that you know, countries and media think across borders, and most media are international anyway. So I don't think there's any problem with that at all. Quite the opposite. That's one of the stated aims of a, you know, the democratic idea of information, that it crosses be between borders. That's in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19. So, so I, don't, I, don't see, I don't see why that should even be an issue conceptually. In terms of, we talked about psychological operations, um, I think we need to recognize we are at war with Russia. I mean, we may not like to use that term. It's definitely at war with us. Um, you know, in terms of NATO countries, it uses economic, psychological, and political warfare. It does it openly now. It's been doing it for years. We've just been in denial, or some countries have been in denial. I remember being in Germany and German businessmen and politicians telling me all the time for many years that Nord Stream 2, the gas pipeline from Russia to, to Germany was just an economic project. And I was like, I lived in Russia. No one in Russia thinks this is an economic project. This is a way to control Europe. But they talk about it openly. In the Russian vision, we live in a world where everybody is trying to break everybody else. They don't believe in globalization as a concept. They've always said globalization is an American plot to control them. They see themselves in political and economic warfare with the West. They see it, I mean, that's just what they've been doing. We've been in denial. So of course, we should be doing political and economic warfare against them. We've introduced economic warfare sanctions or economic warfare. Very stupidly, we're introducing sanctions with no information campaigns. And so what we're letting Putin do is giving him free reign to manipulate how the sanctions are perceived in Russia. And obviously his line is, look what the West is doing to us, they hate us. And you don't need psyops, you know, and I love the way that secret services talk about psyops as if they have some sort of art of communication. It's usually utter bullshit. And you go back against the his across the history, the history of psyops is just, it's like Russian active measures against the West. It's laughable, it's laughable. It's much worse than what any journalist knows, or any editor knows, or any priest knows, or any filmmaker knows. It's pretty laughable. I mean, the, the stuff the Soviets would do to the West in the Cold War, is, it's, it's silly. So we should definitely be throwing all our communications capabilities, including PSYOPs. You know, 
but much more important, the really good forms of communication that we're very, very good at through advertising, through contemporary media, through films, through all the advantages that the internet offers, which, believe me, are a lot more sophisticated than PSYOPs. Of course, we should be using all those forms of communication to at least support the sanctions. You can't have economic warfare without an information campaign. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, we should be doing it in a coordinated way. We should be doing it strategically. We should be doing it together. We need an infrastructure of democratic communication that will be doing this to Russia, to China, to Saudi Arabia, to Iran. We know how they do it. They use information warfare, troll farms, disinformation, conspiracy theories. We don't need to use any of that. We don't need to use any of that because it's tactically not clever when you're dealing with a dictatorship. Dictatorships want their citizens to be confused and passive. If we add to the confusion, we're helping them. Yeah? Putin will be happy if we do disinformation campaigns into Russia because people will get confused because they'll know it's disinformation at some level. And they'll want more Putin. Putin does disinformation to his own people to keep them confused. We have to do the opposite. Democracies are much better at the opposite. We're better at motivation, active, act, making people more active, making them want to seek out more, sharpening their curiosity, and making them realize that their government is not acting in their interests, which it's not. You don't need disinformation for that. You need a very, very deep understanding of Russian society. You need a very deep understanding of the institutions of power. You need a very deep understanding of people's motivations. You can't lecture them. You can't say, Russia bad, that won't work. You have to understand what they care about. That means huge amounts of audience analysis. That means huge amounts of investment into social research, which is hard to do now, but it's still possible. But yeah, I mean, we're in a race everywhere now with extremists, with authoritarians, and then with political propagandists everywhere. To un who will understand audiences better? Everywhere that's the race now. Because where there are so many types of media, people can choose what they want to do. You can't beam down the truth to them. You have to understand what they care about. And the way I always make the comparison between democratic communication and authoritarian and dictatorial ones, or extremist ones, is the difference between a psychotherapist and a cult leader. Both of them understand audiences' vulnerabilities. Both of them really get into people's deepest, darkest desires. But one of them, and that's the cult leader or the dictatorial propagandist, then manipulates that to make people scared and confused and in their power. And the other one, which is the psychotherapist, or what I would like to call a democratic communications mission, starts to bring these things into, into public speech and makes people take responsibility and makes them more active citizens. Um, so yeah, we should be doing a lot, lot more, <laughs> basically. But PSYOPs, I don't know. I mean, maybe they're doing some genius PSYOP thing. But I don't know, whenever you find out what the PSYOP stuff was, it's like the PSYOPs to take down ISIS. Some of the archives are now open. I mean, it's not very impressive. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't think there's some mythical PSYOPs operation somewhere that, that, that is genius. If you look at the history of the Cold War, I mean, it's just planting conspiracy theories and disinformation. It's just like, it's child's play. Sorry, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I hope there are no spies in the room and they're really offended now. And they're like, no, 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 no. We just tell everyone we do bullshit, but actually we have this amazing psyops plan. It's just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't believe this stuff. Nobody left the room. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, At this point, I would like to uh, address uh, you in the audience. Yeah. We've heard a lot of interesting um, ideas and commentaries. And at this point, I would like to give an opportunity to you, our guests, to have some questions. So there are some people in the first row already. Oh. 
Is someone going to be faster than Mr. Zentovsky? Does anyone dare? I would just like to thank the moderator as well as both uh, speakers because this is obviously a topic for several hours which we don't have. Nonetheless, I have three comments. The first, perhaps a palliative one, Mare Marek. As you know, I've been working for Václav Havel from the moment when on New Year's Day in 1990 said that for many years at, on this occasion you've heard that our country is flourishing but I expect that you didn't elect me to tell to lie to you again and our country is not flourishing right now. Nonetheless, and he tried to adhere to it and so am I trying, the standard of a doctor, for a doctor or a politician, or a tram driver, to be truthful from nine to five in their professional life, I think it seems, well, it seems to me somewhat unattainably high. I think that not even possible because I don't know if you can admit it, or, uh, but I do, in medicine, where I've been working for 10 years, and then in even in politics, there's something like a, called a white lie, which is uh, of different character than the other lies. And I'm not going to go into medicine because it's mostly about difficult cases, but a classic example of white lie um, is Ukrainian President Zelensky, before the Russian invasion, he actually lied to his own citizens, saying that nothing will happen, although we knew that it would, Americans knew that it would, he knew that it would, but he did it for a good reason, in order not to cause panic all over the country, to secure the preparation of the defense, and that might be considered perhaps um, an excusable lie. So I propose to bring the standard down a little that I've been sort of trying to um, push for, even in when working for Václav Havel, and that is do not lie openly. Perhaps I may not, not tell you the complete truth, but don't say something that is bluntly not true. Yes, well, there's a simple answer to that. Yes, we do have a presidential standard above the castle that probably most of you know that that truth and love will win over lie and hatred. But medical ethics says that a doctor must not lie. I might withhold the truth a little, but if a patient finds out that the doctor has lied, that they have the right to actually disqualify the doctor. So the doctor may trickle the truth or tell you a part of it, but the doctor must not lie. Then there's the question, of course, very well known, when uh, STB, the secret police, was um, asking, interrogating people, and obviously, yes, uh, if by lying you could actually s save a person's life, then yes, of course, and even Gant uh, mentioned and wrote that if a murderer was following the victim and the victim hid in your house and then 
then Kant would say, well, you mustn't lie, you must tell the murderer that he's at your house, and then you have to fight the murderer. But if you imagine the various interrogations with Gestapo or STB, then obviously it was great to be silent, and if you would be able to save a person's life by lying one, then obviously you would. Same as anyone among us, definitely, everyone would definitely say that it's wrong to kill another person. We definitely shouldn't kill, but if I protect my wife or my children, and if someone comes into my house with a gun, then it might not be the right moment to tell them, well, brother, let's discuss it, and, and so on. No, I have to kill. I have to kill not because I'm bloodthirsty, but because I have to legitimately um, defend the lives that have been entrusted to me. And if there's war, I have to kill, not because I'm a sadist, but I have to protect the lives uh, that have been entrusted to me. So we all know that nothing in medical ethics or any ethics in general is not watertight or absolute. The same thing, I mustn't uh, steal, but if I'm in danger of um, dying of hunger, then of course I may steal. And we can imagine situations where even la a lie could be cautiously used, but still, somewhere above our lives, there should be the presidential standard that many people laugh at, but still a standard that is God is great, and that is the truth um, and love shall prevail over hatred and lie. And when um, the dean mentioned and quoted Pilate, what is the truth? And I might say, who is the truth? Because the base of religion says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and I'm, I'm life. So the truth is not something, but actually someone. Um, so it's actually something that is worth living for, or when it comes to it, even dying for. Well, I believe that we would agree with that. My second note for you, or comment to you, uh, it's also a bit optimistic what you said about artificial intelligence and about the fact that people working behind them will finally come up with an idea of what is ethically or morally correct. I'm afraid that it won't happen, that it will be up to you or us, <laughs> because those dilemmas, moral dilemma, will be not solved by technicians. That's the known cases of like autonomic driving or cars. If it kills a mother with a child, or killing three people, being programmed uh, to kill only one person who uh, walks on the pavement rather than killing three people, and whether this means the free decision to kill someone, unlike unwanted killing. So this is for you. This is not for technicians. And it's, it's better not to ask technicians to make these decisions. And perhaps I said it in a clumsy way. But those who generate the software, it's not the technicians, but those ethical experts who should be in control of what can be entrusted to the technology. OK, and my last <laughs> question. OK, OK, you, f you speak fast, and I have a question to you then. Yeah, so on the AI thing, it's very funny. I mean. There's a, you talked, you mentioned 1984. And I, I think that the 1984 for the internet era is a book called uh, Zed by Joanna Kavanagh, um, which is a satirical novel about a dystopian future ruled by AI. And it's this world where huge companies in China and America are convinced that they know so much about us, they can design the ideal world for us. They can find us the ideal home, the ideal job, you know, the ideal health plan, the ideal wife. It's this idea that our data knows more about us than we do, yeah? The problem is, though, 
is that it doesn't work. So one of the main characters in the book is a, like a Mark Zuckerberg character who owns this company, and he's constantly trying to get the system to find him the ideal girlfriend based on his data, and it keeps on going wrong because you can't put love in an algorithm. And in the novel, people are constantly going mad because they're not happy in this world. And why I think it's an important book is I think the big, the big ideological split in this world is not about capitalism versus communism anymore. It's about communications theory and how it relates to the idea of being free and human. And if you look very closely at what the Chinese, the Russians, and some people in Silicon Valley say about the future and the ideal society, it's very close to what is in Zed. Um, I watched the 100 year anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party where they had this huge celebration of the history of Chinese communism, this huge singing, dancing tableau of the history of the party, you know, the revolution, Mao Zedong, Xi Jinping, all, all sort of pointing to this great future. And at the end, the future appears, but instead of the five-year plan, a huge 5G comes down from the sky. <laughs> and the idea is the future is data. And the Chinese state will centralize all the data, use AI to crunch it, and create the ideal smart city, the ideal marriages, the ideal career, all the things that yeah. is satirized in the book. And their argument is deeply ideological. Their argument says that totalitarianism failed in the 20th century because we didn't have enough data. But the only way to run a society now, when we have the data, is through centralized control. Yeah? All this stuff about, um, all this stuff about liberal democracy, checks and balances, they'll say, look at America, it's a mess. The Russians say something similar. They have this through other ways, they say it, but they deeply do not, they think that they can control society through information. Yeah, it's an idea of the human, yeah? The idea that people don't really have free will in any meaningful way, and they can't organize society in a successful way. You know, it's a theory about the relationship of people, media, and data. And a lot of people say this in the West. Yuval Harari has said something very similar. He says it sadly, but he basically says free will is gone in this new world. Data is everything. In Oxford, Luciano Floridi, the main professor of internet and philosophy, internet and ethics, says we live in a new world where our data knows more about us than we do. Yeah. We don't understand ourselves, the data understands us. So therefore, the only way to control society is to rule the data. And pe lots of people in Silicon Valley will, s will tell you something similar. Democracy is over. Democracy is ineffective. We need huge companies monopolizing data and improving society. And it's a real challenge. They are, it's a very serious argument that they're making yeah, about democracy and the idea of the human. I mean, I deeply disagree with it, but we do have to then create an information environment where the human is valued and where choice is valued and where data works for us. But it's a very serious challenge. It's a very serious challenge. Um, I mean, I think this is going to be one of the, it's going to play out around AI, ethics, how do you design AI so it's good for democracy. It's going to, it's going to play out in this area of, of design and and artificial intelligence and how we use it. But this is a really, this might be the great sort of ideological debate of our times. Well, it's not a new argument, actually. Uh, the founder of behavioralism, B.F. Skinner, wrote a book some maybe 60 years ago, which is called Beyond Freedom and Dignity. And it, it argues that in a complex world of the future, we will simply not be able to afford uh, uh, freedom and dignity, and we will have to control the society through behavioral stimuli, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is an expansion of the argument, but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. Please. Tak, 
je tady někdo s dotazem na naše hosty? Přihlašte se, nebojte se. Ano, uh, tak. Už, už vám nesou mikrofon. Děkuju. Well, hello. Can you hear me? Uh, so I have a question. You mentioned that to sustain a, a civic society, you need a couple of uh, conditions for that. One of that was uh, empathy towards the other person. The other one was uh, shared uh, rules to understand what is facts and evidence. If you scale it up, I think you need the same to attain a civic world, uh, the same understanding between nations or, or countries. Do you think that it is possible uh, at all? And what would you, uh, uh, how could you actually, or how would you empathize with, for example, people of Russia or maybe even Putin for, to understand his actions and what is he doing? That would be one question of mine. And the other one was actually you now when you were talking about the AI and uh, let's say data crassy, uh, uh, Harari actually uh, mentioned uh, in his book uh, Homo Deus, I guess you uh, know, of that, know, of, know of that one, that you can use AI basically uh, to control uh, not the people as such, but you can control the, the government or, or the ruling class of the people. And uh, since, uh, as you said, politicians are sometimes uh, incapable of speaking truth, you could maybe use this kind of uh, technological uh, or technology as such to basically control that. So what do you think of uh, that, uh, or enforce that maybe? What do you think of that uh, use of technology? Thank you. So no, no, I mean, empathy is only works inside systems where people have at least the potential a desire to live in a democratic society and share base values. If they don't share them, then we're at war and you have to win the war. With Russia, we just have to defeat them. And we can talk about what, the, what that means geopolitically and politically. But to do that, you do have to support the economic and military war with, with information. And that does mean understanding. That's not quite the same thing as empathy. Um, I mean, empathy is a complicated idea. I think my, my, my colleague over there will, will tell us more about that. Um, but no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not a, um, no, when people don't want to be part of a democracy or want to destroy democracies, you're at war and you just have to win. I don't have any problems with that. Um, I, I don't think we need to empathize with Putin too much, don't worry. I think we just have to defeat him. That's it. That's my big idea. That was it. I have nothing else to say. You can say. I thought that was for you. No, no, no. Já k tomu, uh, te, 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 vy jste se dotkl té, té, té otázky, která je, která je taky těžko zodpovědět. You touched this question, which is also uh, hard to answer, and that's a question that philosophers in the UK asked. What does Brit make a Brit? That, that I have an ID card, that's one thing. But there should be something, those shared values, such as that everybody knows Shakespeare, or everybody read Dickens, or they have at least some national awareness. So, uh, but does, it doesn't work this way in the UK. So the question today is, like in the Czech lands, what makes Czechs the Czechs? Because we have our ID cards and we everybody read Erben or we know some of the Czech songs, but also we all have health insurance and that we pay people who are not as lucky as us and uh, suffer from rare diseases and we support them through the insurance. So the question is, and that's a large question that I'm not going to answer, do you think that the same society, working society, should have also the same ethical principles? Should it be based also on the same ethics? Or can we agree that someone can uh, support the Sharia, another person can believe in this legal rights, or whether we have core ethical principles and agree at least on some basics on which we would build the society on? Uh, and that's the million-dollar question. 
whether this great call or desire, when we have the global market, we should also have global ethics, and whether it's feasible to agree on basic ethical rules on the whole planet, and we would build e economies on this, or this possibility of editation of DNA. There is a call for uh, all countries having the basic ethical principles in this area, and it's so hard to communicate that with Russia or China. The, is it feasible at all to communicate something like that? Or environmental ethics, we haven't even touched it, uh, let's not touch it. Well, but imagine that the world would agree on basic ethical regulations that everybody would follow. Or in Brazil, if they build uh, Brazilian forests, and we believe, oh, it's a pity to do that. There are so many endemic species, and if it's the hotspot, what about paying them? And uh, then Brazil says, well, take care of your own business. This is our country. And what should we do about that? So perhaps I have left the original question, but surely today there is a big philosophical question. Rather, a plural, plural uh, hesitating Europe than unified Sharia. But what should then what should connect people or unite people in those countries? What values should be follow to be able to survive uh, as a nation if corona crisis comes or a war comes so that we can operate as a nation, as an organism? The time is unfortunately over now or coming to the end. But what I still want to do is to thank our guests very, very much, both Peter Cameron uh, and Pet Marek Orkovacha, giving me a big hand. The debate was very interesting. I hope that you are uh, uh, you've received uh, great impressions from that, whatever they are. And I would like to ask uh, Mr. Jantowski for his final word. And I also want to thank Petra, being the moderator or presenter. Thank you very much. I'm joining in my thanks, in the other people's thanks, to you, Peter and Marek, and um, to all those who listened. And I want to thank also for your uh, contributions in the discussion, including the last one, which actually proves that the freedom of speech and um, censorship is not as bad, and I'm, I'm glad about that, but for this incredible, incredibly short period of time of 90 minutes, we've been able to realize that what we are hoping for, the truth that we keep speaking of, is something very brittle and complex and evasive and the most important thing about the truth is not its establishment, but rather the seeking thereof. And we can carry on with seeking the truth through the world around us and the facts um, that the world reveals to us. The problem might be that, on one hand, the truth constantly seems to be more complex and complicated. Just when Marek spoke about the truth in natural sciences at the very beginning, he said that until recently, things have been understood as, as uh, set into stone, but with the uh, um, discovery of modern physics and Heisenberg's discoveries of insecurity. We don't know whether the elementary element or particle has got the speed or the value, but we don't know both at the same time. And that's revolutionary. And that's, that's a revolutionary revelation about the characteristic of complex truth on a much more metaphorical level, 
This has been expressed by Václav Havel, actually, when he wrote that the most interesting idea is the one that admits that everything can be completely different. And that's the process. That's the seeking of truth. And I'm very grateful to all of you who, have want to, who want to walk on this path, who want to participate on this path, because without an idea of truth, we would be lost. So thank you all. I hope I didn't end uh, or close this too pessimistically. Thank you very much and have a good evening.